Hey everybody, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures on Anatomy and Physiology. Um, I'm Professor Long. These videos are intended for the students taking my course at Del Mar College. Um, this video is for my Human AMP2 course, uh, Biology 2402, and this is Digestion um, Lecture Number One. This is the first uh, in a series of lectures on the digestive system. If anyone else out in uh, YouTube land finds these videos, stumbles across them, finds them helpful, great. I appreciate it. I uh, hope that it helps you. The more people we can help, uh, the better. But again, this is intended for my students. If you're in my class, there'll be some worksheets I put on uh, my Canvas page. And if you're following along on the note set that I publish, it's on page 76 of the note set. We're actually going to start on the bottom of the page. Um, I'll come to the top of the page in the second video. There's a reason I'm going out of order. Um, as you all know, we're in this coronavirus shutdown. We're having to do this stuff pretty quickly to shift from face-to-face um, -to, -face to online. It's a difficult transition for a lot of people. And so all my videos are done impromptu. They're one take, one shot, not a lot of fancy editing. I don't know how to do all that stuff just yet. Um, I got two teenagers here at the house and my dog. So if you all hear some background noise, I'm going to try to work through it and not have to reshoot this video. Um, anyway, um, in part 1 A&P, we began discussing the four major organic compounds. There are four organic compounds that your body is made out of. There's carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. All living organisms are made out of these. Um, and we know that carbohydrates are big chunks of sugars. We take all these individual sugars and we stick them together in these large complex molecules called complex sugars, polysaccharides, or carbohydrates. Um, the simple sugars are how we burn energy. That's ultimately what we use them for. Simple sugars like glucose, where we take a glucose molecule in the presence of oxygen and mitochondria, and we convert that into energy in our cells, ATP. Um, it's so easy to burn the simple sugars that when we consume a whole bunch of them, we burn exactly the amount that we need for energy at that time. Any leftovers, we don't pee out or lose through our body. We keep them, and so we store them as larger molecules. We put them together in big chunks called carbohydrates. We talked about this when we did uh, hormones. We talked about glycogenesis, the conversion of glucose into glycogen, and then glycogenolysis, the breakdown of glycogen into glucose. There's also gluconeogenesis, but we're not going to do that. Um, so, you know, ultimately, when we consume sugar or any food, our body doesn't want to lose any of it. Sadly enough, most animals and even most human beings, more than 50% of the Earth's population, don't know when the next dose of food is going to come from. They don't know when they're going to get to eat again. So when we do consume food, we want to absorb as much of the nutrients as possible and then utilize them. So if I eat more sugar than I need, my body will burn that amount of sugar that's necessary and store the rest. For example, if someone gave you, um, you know, I don't know, $150 and said, go buy some lunch and your lunch is 20 bucks and you got 130 bucks left over, what do you do with that money? Now, you don't just leave it on the counter. You don't throw it out the car window. You don't, you know, do something silly with it, although some people do. What you should do is you might take 20 or $30 and stick it in your pocket so you have cash. And the other 100 or so, you might throw in the bank. And that sugar bank is what glycogen is. It's what you know carbohydrates are. It's much harder to spend that money if it's in the bank than if you have a cash in hand. You spend a dollar here, a dollar there, two dollars here. Before you know it, you can burn through 20 or 40 or 100 bucks really quickly. Same is true of sugars. If we have a bunch of simple sugars sitting around, I can burn them. But if I stick them together in a larger molecule called a carbohydrate, stuff it in my liver or my muscles as glycogen, it becomes much harder to burn. The function of proteins is the proteins are the functional molecules of our cells. They're the enzymes doing all these biochemical reactions and things. There are also structural proteins like the cytoskeleton and those that are stuck inside the cell membrane, like integral membrane proteins that serve as ion channels and, and protein pumps, like the sodium potassium pump, um, glucose channels, and other things. This is how we're going to get amino acids and, and other things into our cells. There's lipids. Excuse me, I'm adjusting my chair. Lipids um, are often used for cell membranes and organelle membranes, as you know. That's their primary function. We can also use lipids as an alternate source of energy. Since they're made out of the same atoms as, as sugars, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, we just have to digest the lipids and rearrange them, and then we can burn them for energy. 
Um, so when we run out of sugar, we burn lipids. So lipids have you know two basic functions: uh, structures for membranes, and then it can be used as an alternate source of energy. The last major organic compound we talked about in part one AMP is um, nitrogen. Nitrogen. The nucleic acids. The nucleic acids include DNA and RNA. And this is the genetic information that's passed from generation to generation. It's how we store and transfer genetic information in this form of a molecule called the nucleic acids. Um, we could go into the details of how nucleic acids function, but ultimately we've done that in part one. So now I'm going to go over those four major organic compounds. And I'm going to go over how they are consumed, what we digest them into, and how they get absorbed. You need to know that form, and you need to know the enzymes that are involved. And mind you, for those of you out in technical land that get to get really, really specific and, and um, uh, very technical, this is a very simplistic overview to set a, a broad foundation. We're going to add all those details in over time. So I'm um, going to keep it simple for now. Now, before I actually get into the digestion of those four organic compounds and do the notes here, I just want to go over some anatomical features for you. Um, that are important for the understanding of what we're about to do. As you remember in the models in uh, laboratory, hopefully, if I were to stare down the digestive tract into the small intestine, there's an area called the lumen, and then the walls of the small intestine are all folded up. And it's a big, thick, muscular tube with lots of layers. But ultimately, from the lumen where the food is, I have to absorb that into the bloodstream and then ship that to my cells, whatever the nutrients are. Now. The lumen of the small intestine has these very large folds, and those large folds would be called a plica, or some people say plica, tomato, tomato. If I were to look at a couple of plica like this, and I look at their, their walls, their walls actually have folds on them. So if the larger fold is a plica, then these smaller folds would each be called a villus. Villus means finger. And they look like little fingers sticking off there. Villi would be plural. If I look on the surface of each villus, it has even smaller folds on its edge, and we call those microvilli for tiny fingers. So in our small intestine, I have folds on top of folds on top of folds. And the more folded it is, the more surface area I can fit in the smaller space. Our digestive tract is so incredibly long and even longer if we keep, include all the folds on top of folds, so that when we are lucky enough to consume something, before whatever I eat comes out the other end, I need to absorb as much nutrition as possible from those molecules before I lose them. Um, like I've said before, you know, most people don't know when their next dose of nutrition is going to come. So if you're lucky enough to eat, you want to absorb as much nutrients as possible. So we have folds on top of folds. Now, if I were to go look at, say, a couple of these villi, so where the villi are, I have the um, cells lining the edge of the villi are simple columnar epithelial cells. Most of your digestive tract is lined with simple columnar epithelium, and they have microvilli on them. So when we eat nutrients, these little microvilli if I were to draw two microvilli, so now I'm going to take a couple of these and draw them like this, they actually have in the cell membrane all these transport proteins. Some of these proteins, these integral membrane proteins, allow the transport of ions like sodium ions and other things. So I have some ion transport proteins. I also have glucose channels that can help absorb glucose or simple sugars. I have some amino acid transporters that can transport the amino acids. And so that's how I'm going to get these nutrients through the lining of the microvilli and the simple columnar cells all the way into the layer of, of connective tissue underlying this digestive epithelium. That layer of connective tissue underneath the digestive epithelium is always referred to as the lamina propria. In our digestive tract, because we're absorbing, we have lots of vasculature there. So I'm going to draw... A couple of these little cells, if I took a, a little section of this and magnified it and drew it across the board here, 
then I would see that right underneath those cells there are these little capillary beds. It's very vascular in here so that I absorb the nutrients into the capillaries, into my bloodstream, and ship them to my cells. And part of the whole process, or part of the whole point of all of this, I'm going to erase all of this. I hope you got kind of a picture in your head of where we're going with it. But part of the point of all this is our bodies need to grow, and they need to repair the damage that's occurring daily um, as we exercise, as we bump into things, and as, as you know, proteins wear out, we need to replace those proteins. And so to repair our daily damage and to grow, we need the supplies that our cells are made out of. If you want to add a second story to your house, then you need boards, you need lumber, you need sheetrock, you need paint, you need windows, you need nails and screws and doorknobs and light bulbs. You need the supplies that they're made of. If your house is getting beat up and falling apart over time due to weather and damage, you still need the same supplies to constantly repair your house and maintain it. That's true of our bodies. Since our bodies are made out of these four major organic compounds, we have to consume them from other organisms that are made out of them either plants and or animals. So we're going to talk about these four major organic compounds. And as I go through them, you need to know four things about each one, or really three things. You need to know what are the alternate names for them. You need to know what enzymes digest them. And then you need to know what molecules are they digested into so that we can absorb them. So before I get started, down here at the bottom of my board, I'm going to draw a blood vessel, one of those capillaries that we saw in one of those villi that I just erased. And I'm going to draw, running across here, some simple columnar epithelium. This would be the epithelial lining, and then this would be the lamina propria with the blood vessels. I'm going to draw a few of the columnar cells here with their microvilli so that we can try to put the pictures together. All right? So now, the first major organic compound that we talk about, carbohydrates. And you often hear people talk about you know, are you eating enough carbs or cut back on carbs? Um, so that's short for carbohydrates. Another name for carbohydrates is this. They are called polysaccharides. Polysaccharides simply means many sugars. Excuse me, let me grab something here. So many sugar is exactly what this is. The molecule is actually um, a whole bunch of simple sugars strung together. So um, when I draw them out, I'm going to try to do sort of a simplistic view of them so that we can um, understand what I'm talking about here. And uh, Oh, look, I put two R's in saccharides. Sorry. Polysaccharides. Um, polysaccharides are also called complex sugars. Okay. Now, what that means is I have a whole bunch of these smaller sugars strung together in these three-dimensional arrays. If you can imagine this in three dimensions, and they're all bound together in chemical bonds, and I can have multiple levels of this stuff. And I'm not going to draw the S's, but everywhere where two points meet, there would be a sugar there. And you can get the picture that I have a whole bunch of sugars in this cube-like structure. This would be a complex sugar or a polysaccharide. Now, when we eat other plants and animals, they are actually storing the sugars in two ways. In a plant, the sugars are stored primarily as a compound called starch. And in animals, the sugar is stored as a molecule that we call glycogen. When we covered the hormones, we talked about glycogenesis, how we convert simple sugars into glycogen. Um, now, our body, when we need energy, we have to eat some form of sugar. And so we have to eat either the animals that ate the plant, or we can go directly and eat the plants. And we break down those simple sugars. I mean, we break down the carbohydrates into simple sugars, absorb them, and then use them for energy. So now with all of this in mind, and you should know that plants store, you know, uh, sugars as starch, animal stored as glycogen in our liver and our skeletal muscle. So now when I take a complex sugar like this and I eat it, this is too large to fit through the tiny proteins that are in the membrane of the cell. So I have to digest it into a small enough subunit that I can absorb it. 
So I'm going to erase part of this carbohydrate. I'm going to erase one level of it. But just know that these are big chunks of molecules of sugars, right? I'm going to digest these through a series of chemical reactions, and I'm going to get two things out of this. One of the things you need to know is the alternate names of carbohydrates, polysaccharides or complex sugars, many sugars, saccharide means sugar. And second thing you need to know is one of the enzymes that digest these molecules. There are two classes or families of enzymes that digest sugars or complex sugars. One is called amylases. You know, anytime you have ASC at the end of a word, it's an enzyme. It's a protein involved in a chemical reaction. And amylases digest um, complex sugars into smaller subunits. And there's another one called saccharidases. Well, that makes sense. Um, oops, I'll have to see off. So saccharidases digest polysaccharides. When we digest them, we're going to get two things out of this. I'm going to get all these individual sh sugar units, like individual glucose molecules, and then those can be absorbed into my digestive tract, into my bloodstream, or through my digestive tract, into the bloodstream, and then shipped off to my cells to burn for energy or to convert back into glycogen. The second thing that I get out of this are these little two sugar units. It's just two simple sugars stuck together. If I have two glucose molecules, we call that maltose. And there's all sorts of um, combinations of these things. So these are called disaccharides. Makes sense. It means two sugars. And ultimately, the disaccharides have to be digested into monosaccharides. And the enzymes that do that digestion are called disaccharidases. Okay. They fall under a subclass of saccharidases. But ultimately, here's what you need to know. We store sugars in our body as, um, as carbohydrates, polysaccharides. In our bodies, they're stored as glycogen in liver and skeletal muscle. If I run out of sugar for energy, my body can tap into this sugar bank. Or if I eat sugar from an external source, my body is going to take that in the lumen of my digestive tract, dump these enzymes called amylases and saccharidases into that lumen, and that will begin to digest these complex sugars into mono and disaccharides. These would be called monosaccharides or simple sugars. These are disaccharides. The disaccharides have to be further digested into monosaccharides. Ultimately, that's what we absorb, and that's what we send to our cells for energy. If there's any left over, they can reconvert this back into glycogen in our liver and our skeletal muscle. So we've got carbohydrates out of the way. I'm going to do one other over here, and then I'm going to do the next two. I'm going to have to erase all of this and do the next two. So just bear with me. I'm dealing with a small board at home. So the next major organic compound we can talk about is proteins. Proteins are also known as polypeptides. And if you don't know this yet, the word peptide also means amino acid. So proteins are long chains of molecules called amino acids. If I use AA as my abbreviation for amino acid, and I take a whole bunch of amino acids and stick them together like this, then each one is a peptide. A whole bunch of them strung together in chemical bonds is called a polypeptide. Now these polypeptides or proteins can fold up on each other. There's all sorts of chemical bonding going in between some of the amino acids. But we're not going to get into protein folding here. Nonetheless, suffice it to say that when we're doing this, one of the things that has to happen when we consume proteins is we need to digest the proteins into its subunits so that we can absorb that into our digestive lining. So once again, proteins are going to go through a series of chemical reactions and get digested into individual peptides or amino acids. All we do is we use enzymes to break these chemical bonds and free up the individual amino acids. They get absorbed through the digestive lining, and then those amino acids get sent to our cells for protein synthesis. Now, the enzymes that digest proteins fall under two classes. One is called proteases, and some books use the term proteinase, and the other one is called peptidases. So again, for each one of these, you need to know three things. Are there alternate names? What are they made out of? These are polypeptides or long chains of amino acids. You need to know what digests them. The enzymes that digest proteins are proteases and peptidases. 
and they get digested into the individual amino acids for absorption. Okay, so now we've got two out of the four knocked out. We got two more to go. I'm going to erase some of this, and I'm going to modify the bottom of my drawing for a specific reason. So bear with me here. Hopefully you got all those notes down. Now, give me a second, and let me get set up for the second part of this. Okay. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to modify this drawing for just a moment. I'm going to put my capillary back at the bottom, which is living in the lamina propria the connective tissue that lies underneath the epithelium. And I'm going to put my epithelium, which is my simple columnar epithelium, but now I'm going to make it go up and down for a part of this. The other half I'm not going to. Okay. There's a reason for this. This is my simple columnar cells. They would have the microvilli, and you get the idea. But one of the things I need to add in here is when we studied the models of the small intestine in lab, we saw these little green things, and they're not really green, but we draw them green, or the pictures always make them green for some reason, called a lacteal. Lacteals are very small vessels that are attached to larger vessels called lymphatic vessels. If you recall when we did tissue perfusion and uh, circulation, we can secrete and reabsorb in the exact same capillary depending on pressures. So we have tissue perfusion where we force stuff out into the tissues, and then the cells will actually um, release toxins and trash and waste and carbon dioxide, and we reabsorb it back in the same capillary. Now, we call that recall of fluids. But we only recall about 85% of the fluid that we um, perfuse out into the tissue back into the same capillary. The remaining fluid was absorbed through the lymphatic system, and then lymphatic vessels will eventually fuse up with our venous system, and those fluids will be dumped back into our bloodstream. Well, the lymphatic system is called what it's called because it's interrupted by little nodules of tissue, little bundles of tissue called lymph nodes that are rich with monocytes and lymphocytes. As you know, monocytes are very phagocytic. They gobble up any trash or debris or foreign proteins and things. And lymphocytes secrete antibodies against foreign proteins. And it makes sense that we would be absorbing the lipids, which we're about to absorb, into the lymphatic system since the cell membrane um, is made out of lipids. And if we had any um, toxic bacteria or anything else that we consume or any other substances, we could kind of run them through our lymphatic system and check them and maybe have an immune response. Nonetheless, um, that's what the lacteals are. They're part of the lymphatic system that will drain into our blood vessels, and there's a reason for them. So when it comes to lipids, there's another, there's a specific class of lipids that we tend to focus on for energy metabolism, and I'm going to focus on them. But lipids are um, very often called fats, oils, or waxes. If it exists as a fat, as an oil, or as a wax in nature, then it's a lipid, like animal fat, bacon fat, or vegetable oil, olive oil, um, any kind of oils and waxes, like beeswax or earwax. Anyway, the major class of lipids that I want to focus on is called triglycerides. And they have three glycerol molecules attached to another molecule, so they call them triglycerides, three sugars, or three glycerols, an alcohol form of sugar. Nonetheless, um, when we consume fats, one of, the, one of the fats that we want is triglycerides for energy and for other things. We have to digest those triglycerides through a series of chemical reactions. We digest those triglycerides into two things. One of those things is called fatty acids, which you'll see me abbreviate as FA sometimes. And the other one is called glycerol, which you'll see me abbreviate as a G sometimes. So we're going to absorb fatty acids and glycerol into the lacteals, and then those get absorbed into our bloodstream, and then we can go and recombine them and form triglycerides or use them for other things. And the enzymes that break down lipids are called lipases. Ase always means enzyme, so lipases digest lipids, pretty simply named. So you, here's the three things you need to know. The other names for lipids are fats, oils, and waxes, and we're going to focus on triglycerides. The enzymes called lipases will digest these, and they're specific lipases for specific fats. But nonetheless, 
Lipases digest fats into fatty acids and glycerol, and then we absorb the fatty acids and glycerol into the lacteals, the lymphatic system, and then dump it into our bloodstream and send it to our cells. The last major organic compound we're going to talk about are the nucle nucleotides, or the nucleic acids, I should say. The nucleic acids are called polynucleotides. So what that means is they are long chains of these other molecules called nucleotides. Okay, if I put a whole bunch of nucleotides together, then I get DNA or RNA. When I consume a piece of chicken or you know any kind of meat or any plant, it's made up of these four major organic compounds. And I'm going to take the nucleotides, the DNA and RNA in chicken or lettuce or tomato, and I'm going to use the exact same ones for my cells, but in order to build new DNA molecules to replicate, to build new um, nucleic acids, RNAs and mRNAs and tRNAs and things, I need the building blocks. But the order of the bases in chicken DNA might be different than the order of bases in human DNA, so we have to digest the chicken or the lettuce DNA into individual subunits. So as I digest the nucleotides through a series of chemical reactions, I'm going to get individual nucleotides out of this. The enzymes that digest nucleic acids into individual nucle nucleotides are called nucleases. And there's a whole bunch of different nucleases. Um, one of my favorites is one called ribonuclease uh, P. Anyway, ribonuclease A. One of them is self-catalytic. Whole world of virology, and I'm not going to go into that. <clears throat> Chemical evolution stuff. Cool stuff. Um, anyway, the nucleotides have to be further broken down into three substances. Each nucleotide is made up of three other things. There's a five-carbon sugar, ribose if we're talking about RNA, deoxyribose if we're talking about DNA. Okay. That five-carbon sugar can be absorbed. There's a molecule that's a PO4 with a negative. That's a phosphate ion. And the phosphate is the P and ATP and GTP and the other phosphates. So we got to absorb the phosphate. And then we get a nitrogenous base. The nitrogenous base is going to be the A, the T, the G, the C, or the U. Adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, or uracil. And we absorb that. We can take these molecules and reassemble them into DNA, into nucleotides for DNA and RNA or we can use them for other things. Okay. I'm not going to get into that level of detail just yet, and we don't need to worry about the enzymes that break down nucleotides. But nonetheless, you need to know all four major organic compounds. Carbohydrates, what are alternate names, what are they made out of, what enzymes digest them, and what do they digest them into for absorption. You need to know proteins, what are their alternate names, what are they made out of, amino acids, what are they digested by? The enzymes, proteases and peptidases. What are they digested into? The amino acids for absorption. You need to know lipids are digested by lipases in the fatty acids and glycerol, particularly triglycerides. We absorb that into the lacteals of the lymphatic system first and then into our blood. And then nucleic acids or polynucleotides are digested by nucleases in the individual nucleotides those later get digested into 5-carbon sugars and phosphate in the nitrogenous space, which we covered in Part 1 AMP, and then we absorb that into our digestive system, or through the digestive lining into our bloodstream. All of those molecules that we absorb down here, the simple sugars, the amino acids, the fatty acids, the glycerol, the 5-carbon sugar, the phosphate, the nitrogenous space, all of those things are going to be things that later on we refer, refer to as nutrients. That's a major component of the nutrients that we need for our body, for nutrition, to grow and build and make our bodies nice and healthy. There's other things that we need, but we're not going to get into that right now. So ultimately, this the point of this whole lecture is you need to know the four major organic compounds that our bodies are made out of. You need to know alternate names. You need to know the enzymes that digest them. What are they digested into so that we can absorb them and how are they absorbed? particularly the fatty acids and glycerol, get absorbed into the lacteals. All right? So if you're in my class, I hope this was informative, and I hope you had as much fun as I did. If you're not in my class, I hope you had as much fun as I did anyway, and I hope you learned something. Anyway, 
This will conclude my lecture on the digestive system, at least the first one. we got some more lectures to come, so thanks for bearing with me, and thanks for watching. Hope you learned something. Hope you had a good time. See ya.